Well, we've made it to the last section, plantar fasciitis, down at the foot of things. The plantar fascia, we're all familiar with it. It's one of those conditions that we see on a regular basis. One of the most common extremity conditions that you and I manage and can manage very successfully. The plantar fascia is an important component of the biomechanical process of pronation and the important process of the windlass mechanism that the plantar fascia inserts on the calcaneus travels down onto the toes. And when the toes dorsiflex during toe off, what happens is that that plantar fascia wraps itself around the metatarsal heads, creating tension, which pushes the arch of the foot upward. That's what locks the foot out. So that windlass mechanism and the plantar fascia are intimately related with each other. Plantar fascia is the most common cause of heel pain. That 10% of the population is going to suffer from this problem at some point in time. It's more common once we get a couple of years under our belt because like many other conditions, it's something that's cumulative. Once the glass overflows, that's when we have symptoms. Now plantar fasciitis is often unilateral, but in 20 to 30% of the cases, it can be bilateral. One thing that we wanna be very cognizant of though is in a bilateral neuropathy or a bilateral condition like plantar fasciitis, it may be something systemic. In the case of bilateral heel pain, 16% of those are actually arising from an inflammatory arthropathy, something like rheumatoid arthritis, or one of the things that you see on the screen here. I'm going to pass along this infographic to you as well, one of the handouts that you'll be able to download from the resource at the end of the presentation so that you can take a look at that. I use this resource probably on an every other two or three day basis, that I keep a laminated copy in each treatment room. And when a patient comes in with a condition that starts to, to trigger my thoughts, as to maybe this is an inflammatory arthropathy, I can pull it out and ask the appropriate questions. Now, the majority of plantar fascia patients aren't related to an inflammatory arthropathy. They're, they're related to the glass overflowing because of too many stressors. They have jobs that they're on their feet for a long period of time. They're uh, walking on floors, they're standing, they're running. Their um, plantar fascia has absorbed more stress than what it wants to tolerate. The plantar fascia alone has to absorb seven times body weight during normal activities of daily living. When we ramp those activities up to include running and jumping, it becomes much more dramatic. And there are some factors that can help that problem to become more prevalent. And those predisposing factors include if we have a loss of the arch of the foot, either a flat foot, pes planus, or a loss when we're walking, hyperpronation, if there's a limited ankle dorsiflexion, which we know most of our patients have tight gastrocs and soleus from sitting all day long, especially anybody who's wearing heels, they're going to be tight gastrocs and soleus. That's a predisposing factor for plantar fasciitis. If um, the patient has tightness up higher in the chain with hamstring hypertonicity, that's another predisposing factor, not only for plantar fasciitis, but for many of the conditions in the lower chain. And certainly if they have more weight than what they should, that's a problem. If they put that weight on quickly, that's an even bigger problem because those tissues and muscles haven't had the ability to adapt and compensate for that. So there was no ramp up time and the, and the patient overloaded those tissues. Plantar fasciitis, we all know the classic presentation, the first step in the morning. When they step out of bed, it feels like they're standing on a nail, a sharp discomfort. They'll have pain with the push-off phase. They'll have pain when they bear weight for any period of time. Walking upstairs is uncomfortable. And when they start moving quicker, like sprinting or forefoot running, that's an even bigger deal. Our normal gait cycle is heel to toe. But a lot of runners have adapted a four-foot pattern. There are many benefits to a four-foot pattern. There's greater shock absorption. You can use the kinetic energy stored in the gastroc and soleus to help propel you forward. And you spend less time going upward, more time going forward. But there is absolutely a greater strain on the posterior chain, including the gastroc and soleus, the Achilles tendon, and the plantar fascia. So we're transferring load from one to the other it's usually a safe transfer, but we need to make sure that those patients who are forefoot running, especially if they've gone from solely hind foot running and then tried to implement forefoot running, they're a great candidate to develop one of those posterior chain problems. When we palpate the pain, the discomfort really can be anywhere throughout the distribution of that plantar fascia. Yes, in the majority of cases, 52% of the time, it's right on the heel. Most of the time, it's slightly on the medial side of that heel as opposed to the lateral side. But then it can travel down throughout the forefoot and even into the ball of the foot as we can see in this example here. 
Many times in addition to the tenderness, it'll just feel rough and bumpy that there's palpable bands of tenderness through that tissue. So how do we assess the plantar fascia? Well, number one, we'll use the hyperpronation cluster. We've gone through this before and the hyperpronation cluster means that when we stand and from behind and the patient, we're looking at the standing patient, we see too many toes. There's excessive forefoot abduction. That we see a bow in the Achilles tendon or we see a loss of that medial longitudinal arch. One of the other tests that's specific or more specific to plantar fascia problems is the great toe dorsiflexion sign. So this is simply palpating the tender area and then repalpating that with the great toe and dorsiflexion. So when I dorsiflex that toe, I'm putting a, an increased stretch on the medial band of the plantar fascia, making it more prominent, it can't escape, and it's going to be more sensitive. So the uh, great toe dorsiflexion sign is usually positive in our patients with plantar fasciitis. The other thing that can be helpful is the windlass test, which is simply passively dorsiflexing the patient's toes and saying, does that hurt? If they have a heel pad syndrome, chances are that's not going to hurt. But if they have plantar fascia tenderness and we stretch that, it's probably going to provoke those symptoms. Now, as we talked about other things in the differential diagnosis for plantar fasciitis, our exam needs to think about those other things. One of the things that can come up is Baxter's neuropathy. Baxter's neuropathy is an irritation of the posterior tibial nerve. In fact, the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve. And that irritation causes a very similar set of symptoms. It looks almost identical to plantar fasciitis. In fact, Baxter's, Baxter's neuropathy is thought to be contributory to 20% of heel pain, so one in five patients. The one test that's particularly useful for identifying Baxter's neuropathy is having the patient abduct all five toes. If they're unable to abduct their little toe, that means that there's potentially weakness in the abductor digiti minimi, which is supplied by that first branch of the lateral plantar nerve. So in our heel pain patient who we've diagnosed with plantar fasciitis, they've not improved after four or five visits, have them spread their toes. And if they can't abduct their digit, we need to look at potential irritation to that posterior tibial nerve and the first branch, the lateral plantar nerve. The other thing that we'll often see is patients who have concurrent bony problems of heel spurs. Now, most of the time, that heel spur is a symptom of long-standing plantar fasciitis. That that spur didn't all of a sudden grow into the tissue and start poking into it. That spur was tractioned by the tissue over a long period of time, and that tension actually stretched the bone into a heel spur. So a spur by itself is not symptomatic. It means that there is something that's causing those symptoms. The other thing that we want to take a look for is the possibility of a heel stress fracture, especially in our athletes and soldiers who are pounding on those feet for long periods of time. So plantar fasciitis, when we squeeze that patient's calcaneus, it shouldn't hurt. When they walk on their toes, they're unloading the calcaneus and that shouldn't, shouldn't hurt as well. But our stress fracture patients who have a problem with the calcaneus don't like to have their, their heel squeezed and when they walk on their toes, it feels better because we're unloading that calcaneus. So plantar fasciitis hurts when we're toe walking and stress fractures feel better when we're toe walking. The same thing is true of another condition that affects something very close to the, the calcaneus and that is the heel fat pad. That there's a shock absorbent fat pad beneath the inferior calcaneus and that shock absorbent pad helps to dissipate forces, but over time it can degenerate like so many other tissues. And as it thins, now those forces are directed more into the calcaneus and the fat pad becomes irritable and the calcaneus can, can become irritable. This is a condition that's become much more commonly recognized in recent years. Fortunately, we've done a blog on this. And so what I'd like to do is to take just a couple of minutes and play the blog that we did on it, which does a decent job of explaining what heel pad syndrome is and what we can do in order to help manage it. So let's take a minute and check out this blog and I'll show you where to get access to that as well in just a second. Hi, it's Tim from Cairo. We're here with Kara today and we're gonna talk about heel pain, one of the most common presentations. So our patient comes in, they have pain when they walk, especially on hard surfaces. We have a lot of things in the differential. Could be plantar fasciitis, it could be a heel pad syndrome, it could be a calcaneal stress fracture, or even a neuropathy. How do we differentiate? Let's talk about the exam. First thing we have to do is the patient do a heel drop test. 
They come up on their toes and drop down. That's going to hurt things that are locally irritated. The mechanics of heel pad syndrome, plantar fasciitis, or certainly a calcaneal stress fracture. It's probably not going to be overly provocative in somebody who has a neuropathy, whether that be a tarsal tunnel or Baxter's. The next test that we can use is simply having them walk on their toes. Somebody with heel pad syndrome, irritation in the inferior aspect of the calcaneus, feels better when they get their heel off the ground. Whereas somebody with plantar fasciitis, because of the windless mechanism, we're tractioning that plantar fascia when they're up on their toes. It doesn't feel any better when the, than when they're walking on their feet. The next thing that we can do is use our hands. So we have the patient lie down and palpate the area of discomfort. So we take the patient's leg up, we'll support it a little bit, and if I poke on the medial aspect of the calcaneus, there should be number one, a springiness to the area. That a healthy heel pad should be about two centimeters thick and it should be springy. If we feel atrophy, we're suspicious of the heel pad syndrome. Secondly, when we poke the center of the calcaneus, if that causes pain, that again indicates heel pad syndrome. Whereas we know most of our patients with plantar fasciitis have their pain a little bit more in the medial inferior aspect of the calcaneus as opposed to the central aspect. The next thing that we're going to do is find out, does the calcaneus itself hurt? So if we suspect a calcaneal stress fracture, we can do a squeeze test where we're compressing the medial and lateral aspect of the calcaneus far on the outside, away from where the plantar fascia irritation is. And if that causes pain, now we're suspicious of a calcaneal stress fracture. And the last things that we want to differentiate are the neuropathies, that we all know what to do for a lumbar neuropathy, or a lumbar radiculopathy, I should say, but the peripheral neuropathies of a Baxter's neuropathy or a tarsal tunnel syndrome would be evaluated more locally. So for a tarsal tunnel syndrome, where the posterior tibial nerve is irritated, we're going to have pain in the arch and pain into the heel itself. So the way that we'll do that is the same thing we do for any other peripheral neuropathy. We're going to stretch it and we're going to compress it. Think of phalans and reverse phalans. So to stretch it, we're going to take that patient's foot into some dorsiflexion eversion while extending their toes. In holding that position 10 to 15 seconds, and with that ischemia saying, is there a reproduction of discomfort? If that's not enough, let's add some compression. So we put that patient's foot into the dorsiflexion eversion test and now add some compression over the posterior tibial nerve. If that triple compression test isn't positive, probably not a tarsal tunnel syndrome patient. And the other sneaky condition that we want to watch for is Baxter's neuropathy. That's irritation of the a branch of the posterior tibial nerve that comes underneath the calcaneus, the inferior calcaneal nerve. It supplies the heel and the arch. When it's irritated, it looks very much like plantar fasciitis. The one differentiating maneuver here is that, that the uh, inferior calcaneal nerve also innervates the abductor digiti minimi. So a patient with Baxter's, Baxter's neuropathy is often not able to provide resistance, that those toes just go together when we squeeze on them, as opposed to Kara who's able to hold their toe out really well. So we're not suspecting a Baxter's neuropathy. I hope that this information helps you differentiate heel pain. There's lots of possibilities and they're all treated differently. If you'd like to learn more about the number two cause of heel pain, which is heel pad syndrome, 10 to 15% of the population suffers from this at some point in their lifetime. And 15% of all plantar, plantar heel pain patients have a heel pad syndrome. We've done some homework on that one. Our advisory board, with the help of Tom, Dr. Tom Ashad, have put together a protocol on heel pad syndrome. We hope that you'll check it out. We've detailed a little bit in the blog, otherwise going to chiroup.com. You'll be able to reference that condition report as well as all of the other condition references of the things we've talked about. Hope you've enjoyed this and we look forward to connecting again. In the I hope that you've enjoyed that information. If you're interested in seeing any of the other blogs on plantar fasciitis, those are available on the ChiroUp website. If you go to ChiroUp.com, click on resources, there'll be blog and you can search for any topic. We've done uh, hundreds and hundreds of blogs at this point on multiple topics, and anytime new information comes out, we try to relay that along. I'll play one more pertinent blog on plantar fasciitis in a few minutes. <clears throat> but before we do that, let's talk about what do we do in order to manage plantar fasciitis? How do we help the patient get out of pain? Well, here's some new research over just the last couple of years that this is transverse friction massage and stretching of the gastroc soleus are typically very, very helpful at relieving plantar fascia pain. Because the goal of that is to loosen up the gastroc and soleus through stretching so that the plantar fascia doesn't have to absorb as much force. When I step down and lean forward, my plantar fascia is part of that spring mechanism. If the gastroc and soleus are tight, 
it's more a part of that spring mechanism because it has to, it has to absorb more of that stretch in order to get the same degree of dorsiflexion. If I can loosen the gastroc and soleus, I'm going to have less stress on the plantar fascia. So no surprise that stretching the gastroc and soleus is helpful and also stimulating some blood flow and breaking up adhesions in that fascia itself. So working out the gastroc and soleus, we've seen this video before. We're going to apply a pressure to that gastroc and soleus with the foot in a plantar flex state so that the muscle is loose and then we're going to dorsiflex that patient's ankle as we strip through that trigger point. So I'm taking it down, now dorsiflexing the ankle and stripping through that trigger point. A great way to work out the plantar flexors. The other thing that we can consider is using our dull screwdriver, our factor tool, or our ISDM tool to scrape out those adhesions. We wanna be cognizant of the red things here, the nerve, the lateral and medial plantar nerves, which branch out. So we want to make sure that that patient isn't getting any numbness, paresthesia, or sharp shooting pains when we do that. Typically, I find most benefit by working the fascia near the heel itself, especially the medial calcaneal border. The other thing that's helpful is to make sure that that patient has adequate arch support. Ultimately, we'd like that to happen by strength of the posterior tibialis but sometimes in the short run, they'll need an orthotic or they'll need a Fabrifoam wrap, a tensoplast wrap, or sometimes even a medial heel wedge, which just tips that foot up a little bit and takes a little bit of stretch off of the plantar fascia, off of the Achilles tendon. Earlier, we talked about a tensoplast wrap, and that's something that's particularly helpful for our plantar fasciitis patients. I love to give my plantar fasciitis patients this to wear at nighttime. I think that it helps them because what happens at nighttime is the arch springs back up into this neutral state, uh, into a shortened state, and then when we step down in the morning, we tear that apart. So if we can keep that, that fascia stretched just a little bit, either with a boot, a Strasburg sock, or a wrap, then we're going to have a little longer healing length, and when the patient steps down, there's not, not quite as much possibly to stretch and to tear. So we can use a wrap, or we can use one of these other things which are typically a little less popular with the patient, sometimes necessary, but a little less popular to immobilize them. Then, what do we teach the patient to do at home? This is a crucial part of the recipe, and that recipe includes getting some blood flowing to the area and breaking things up. So we'll have that patient roll over a frozen water bottle or a golf ball, just to get a little bit of elasticity and a little bit of movement in the area. The other thing that we can have the patient do is to stretch out the gastroc and soleus. Remember the tightness in the plantar flexors is a major issue. So I have that patient do that on a step. They can do it on a stairwell by dropping their feet down and then coming back up and dropping their feet back down and gradually just stretching that out a little bit further each time. There's lots of ways to stretch that. This is an example of stretching it with all your weight on one foot. So if it's a unilateral problem, Getting all the weight on one foot can be a little bit more helpful when she drops her heel down now to help stretch that out. The other thing that we can stretch is the plantar fascia itself. And the plantar fascia stretch is having the patient sit in a figure four position and then dorsiflexing just their, um, their great toe. Sometimes they can even do some self-massage just through that medial band. We don't want them to dig in with a tool on their own or with a lot of pressure, but just getting a little bit of blood flowing as they're dorsiflexing, almost a plantar fascia release type technique. And then strengthening some of the muscles of the foot, including this one, the flexor digitorum brevis. And the best way to strengthen that that I've found is by putting a band underneath the patient's foot, having them step on it, and then dorsiflexing their foot. So as they dorsiflex their foot down, they're able to get a stretch through that band to help loosen that tissue up. The other tissue that we certainly want to loosen up is the posterior tibialis, uh, that we want to strengthen up is the posterior tibialis. So this is the muscle that helps to support the arch of the foot. Remember, coming off the tibia, behind the medial malleolus, under surface of the foot, it's that bungee cord. So if we can tighten that up a little bit, we're going to have potentially a little bit better arch support for the patient. And so having them sit in the chair, look at the under surface of their foot, drop it back down, look at the under the surface of their foot and drop it back down. Now, our modality is beneficial? That in recent years, we've seen a lot of data that say modalities really aren't overly beneficial for some of our patients. That we're moving away from passive care modalities and much more into active care. All of these exercises are active care, but I do believe that there are some passive care modalities that can help the patient. 
And one of those passive care modalities is this, shockwave therapy. So shockwave therapy has emerged in the market in, in recent years, um, and it's been proven as a very helpful tool for a couple of conditions, especially tendinopathies and plantar fasciitis. So let's talk about the etiology of these conditions for just a second. We talked about it earlier with greater trochanteric pain syndrome, but a quick recap is that our old model was that tissues become inflamed for a long period of time, that you had a chronic lateral epicondylitis, a chronic medial epicondylitis. And the new model says, no, itis goes away after about three days. So our old treatments, which used to try to suppress inflammation with rest and ice and ultrasound and NSAIDs, didn't work for rotator cuffs, elbows, knees, ankles, feet. And the reason they didn't work is because that inflammation has left, and rather than trying to suppress an inflammatory reaction, we should be trying to initiate a controlled inflammatory reaction. So all of our treatments now are aimed at doing that for tendinopathies. We don't want to initiate controlled inflammation in an acute disc or in a cervicogenic headache. We want to do this for a tendinopathy and things like plantar fasciitis. So for those tissues, rather than using the rest in the ice and the anti-inflammatories, we're doing pro-inflammatory modalities. So what do we use now? We're using cold laser. We're using IASTM, Graston, Factor. We're um, doing things like uh, pulsed uh, a, a ESWT, electroshock wave therapy, in order to increase some inflammation in the area. We're giving the patients exercises, but not just any exercise. We're giving them eccentric exercises, the most challenging type of exercise. So all of our treatments are directed at stimulating some blood flow to the area, stimulating the, the body's ability to heal itself. <clears throat> and shock wave therapy is one of those things that's come onto the market it started out as lithotripsy of blowing up kidney stones, and then it transitioned through the years. And now it's something that's frequently used for tendinopathies and for plantar fasciitis. And shockwave therapy, we can buy shockwave therapy machines. There's two varieties. There's something called Focused. A Focused shockwave therapy is pretty expensive, about $30,000. It's a narrower wave. A radial shockwave therapy broadens the beam out a little bit, a little fanned out, and it's not as expensive in general. They can go from 10,000 up. Um, and shockwave therapy is very quick, that you're only going to use it for two or three minutes. So the plus side is it's quick. The downside is it doesn't count as a, as a billable modality to an insurance company or as an ICD code, I'm sorry, a CPT code, because it's not long enough to meet that criteria. But it is very quick and it is a tool that has proven merit. The way that it works is that that shockwave machine, that blue tube that you see the practitioner holding, is hollow that has a little ball inside of it. And so the air gun that, that it's connected to a unit, a compressor basically, that then shoots air in and out of that little tube. And as it shoots that air in, it bounces that ball very rapidly. And when the ball strikes that transducer at the end, it sends a shockwave into the tissue. And that shock wave is designed to stimulate blood flow to break up some tissues. That's what it was destroying kidney stones with. And when it breaks up that tissue, in this case, it's just stimulating a controlled inflammatory reaction. So it's able to stimulate the body's own healing response. Now, this is one of a lot of tools that can do that. You can use a shock wave therapy machine. This one's a Chattanooga machine here, simple to use. Um, you can use a Graston tool or a factor tool with it. You can use transverse friction massage. One of the keys is I don't think you need to use them all because we're looking for a controlled inflammatory reaction, not an uncontrolled inflammatory reaction. So I don't know that there's a need to use all of those modalities. You need to pick one that works for you and stick with it. And there's research, plenty of research to say, yes, this is one thing, one of those that does work. Um, here's another study that came out just a year earlier than the last one, uh, that shockwave therapy and low-level laser therapy are both very effective. Here's another one along those same lines. Dry needling seems to be a reliable procedure. We see abundant research that it, at Cairo Up, we look through hundreds of studies each week. Anything that comes out on 105 different topics, if it's part of a game-changing recipe, related to 105 different musculoskeletal conditions, we harvest that research and update protocols with it. And we see a lot of information on dry needling, a lot of information on shockwave, on cold laser, on eccentric exercise. Those are the things that tend to really have benefit for tendinopathies and plantar fasciitis acts much like a tendinopathy. So dry needling is, is another one of those that's really coming into the market uh, hot 
and it's uh, showing proving itself uh, merit. So our home advice for somebody who has plantar fasciitis, they need to minimize the activity. We don't want to do things that put a lot of stress on that. We also don't want them to break the terrible twos. So a gradual increase in activity, 10% per week, avoid hill running. If you're a four foot runner, you may need to transition or even a hold off on running for a short period of time, transitioning to cycling. But either way, if that patient can increase their stride width and stride rate, they'll have less on that. And we also wanna make sure they have good shoes. Remember the rule that 300 to 500 miles should be about the end of the, the lifespan for a set of shoes. So keeping into that range will be good. Now I have one more blog that I'd like to play for you. It's one that we did um, a couple of months ago. It's five tools for treating plantar fasciitis. It'll recap a couple of the things we talked about. It'll also talk about a couple of new ones. I'll play this, it's about five minutes, and then we'll talk about uh, where you can access that, that blog as well. Hi, it's Tim from Cairo Up. This week we're gonna talk about a problem that affects 10% of the population, and that's plantar fasciitis. We all know the plantar fascia on the undersurface of the feet runs from the medial calcaneus, spans out onto all five toes. And that band is important for locomotion because the foot has two roles. It has to be a flexible shock absorber, like when you step on a rock or a root, but then it needs to turn into a rigid lever to propel yourself, especially when you're running. You wouldn't want to hit a baseball with a bat that was flexible, and you don't want to propel yourself with a foot that's flexible. But it needs to transition between those two, and there are two ways that happens. Number one, is the process of pronation. But number two is the plantar fascia. That because of the windlass mechanism, when the foot and toes dorsiflex, the plantar fascia wraps around that first metatarsal and the metatarsal heads and tightens up. And when it tightens, it pushes the arch up, locking out the foot, turning it into that rigid lever. Well, that happens all day long, which means that there's stress all day long and there starts to become irritation, especially at the origin of that band near the medial calcaneus. So the question is, what can you and I do to make a difference? We know that our treatment works, especially when we have a multifactorial treatment plan, that we're addressing it through manual therapies and through exercise. So I'd like to show you real quick what I do for the patient in office, and that'll complement this blog of what you can do at home or the patient can do at home. The first thing that we're going to see is usually some tightness in the gastroc and soleus. Anybody who's had chronic issues in their feet often have lost the ability to dorsiflex. And when your calf can't be that shock absorber, now the plantar fascia has to be that shock absorber. So one of the things that I'll do is I'll put the foot into dorsiflexion and I will strip through the gastroc and the soleus. Usually we'll, we'll put a little bit of lotion on here and we can do that as a motion stripping as well to loosen up that gastroc and soleus. The other thing that we'll wanna do is we'll wanna stimulate a little blood flow to that plantar fascia and break up adhesions. So I'll use my instrument, whether it be a factor tool or whatever you'd like, and I'm going to work through the plantar fascia itself, through the band, especially the medial aspect of that band up onto the heel, and then we can take our, our Graston tool or our ISTM tool, our factor tool, and scrape across transverse friction-wise at the origin of that band. We're recognizing that plantar fasciitis isn't always an itis. Sometimes it's an apathy, like a lot of the other things we treat in the elbow and shoulder and knee and ankle. And it needs an increase in blood flow rather than a suppression of that inflammation. So the, the IASTM tool, the factor tool, allows us to accomplish that. One thing that sometimes we forget is that other muscles tighten up too, especially the hamstring, if you could flip over. That hand, patients who have plantar fasciitis are nine times more likely to have hypertonicity in the hamstring. So we'll make sure we stretch that out with a contract, relax, go ahead and push down, relax, and then stretch. Push down for three to seven seconds, relax and stretch. And finally, the last thing is that patients who have a plantar fasciitis often have coexistent hyperpronation. Let's face it, that's how they got plantar fasciitis in the first place. And that chronic pronation puts a lot of stress on the tarsal bones, Bones and, and cartilages that are stressed become inflamed, become sticky, and become stuck. So you and I have a great role to mobilize those joints. And one of the joints that I like to mobilize is the subtalar joint by applying a little bit of an axial distraction using my index fingers right at the crux of the ankle and applying a quick axial distraction to get some mo mobility back into that ankle joint. Those are the, some of the things that I use in office, but at home, it's equally important that the patient play an active role in their recovery. We especially want them to strengthen the intrinsic muscles of their feet and the posterior tibialis. That the intrinsic muscles of the feet can be strengthened by things like a single leg stance or a valet's where the patient is standing a couple of inches from a wall and they move their nose toward the wall. 
that's going to cause a lot of activation of those intrinsics. The other muscle that we don't want to forget is the posterior tibialis, which is going to run from the undersurface of the foot up into the back of the calf. It's kind of like a piece of duct tape that holds that plantar fascia up when the patient's walking and running. And ultimately, we'd like that intrinsic support to be the primary support so that the patient doesn't have to rely on an orthotic or rely on an arch support. They're wearing this 24-7 as opposed to having to change out that orthotic or arch support. And one of the ways that I like to strengthen the posterior tibialis is with a piece of, of therapy band. The patient will put that underneath their foot and then into a figure four and simply roll their foot up as though they're trying to look at the undersurface of their foot. So we're activating the posterior tibialis, trying to make that a participant in holding that arch up. This week's blog is gonna talk about a couple of important things that we can do at home as well. A couple of the tools we'll use, number one, Lysol, dealing with feet. Not sure what that, why that's there, but outside of that, we're talking about taping techniques, whether it be an elastic therapeutic tape or another technique with a slightly more rigid tape of tensoplast. We'll talk about how you can incorporate boots or Strasburg socks to help hold that up so that the plantar fascia heals in a lengthened state because so many times the patient has pain with the first step in the morning. That's because they've torn that up all day long. They go to bed at night, their arches spring back up into this nice shortened state, and the first time they stretch that out, it's like pulling a cut open each morning. That's going to be painful, whereas a Strasburg sock or a brace or a tool to help hold that foot in dorsiflexion will allow the tissue to heal in a lengthened state. And finally, we'll talk about things that you can give that patient if they need some support but can't wear an orthotic or an arch support, things like a PSC Fabrifoam wrap. I hope that you enjoy the information in the blog. I'd love to hear what your recipe is for treating plantar fascia and I'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks for watching. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you were able to learn something from it. If you'd like to access that video, you can go to chiroup.com, click on resources, and it'll open up this page for the blog. And you can search for the blog. This one's name, remember, was five tools for plantar fasciitis. If you just type in plantar fasciitis, you'll be able to see all of the blogs that we've done for that and be able to access them. If you don't currently get the blog, by all means, go to the right side and sign up for the blog so that you get the current information that comes out each week. We'll summarize it and dump it into your inbox. Um, finally, the clinical pearls for plantar fasciitis is we need to recognize that pes planus and hyperpronation are the leading causes of them. We want to make sure we've ruled out other problems like tarsal tunnel syndrome, Baxter's, Baxter's neuropathy, and heel pad syndrome. We also want to make sure that if it's bilateral in particular and the patient may have some other signs and symptoms of an inflammatory arthropathy, that those are, are out. The heel spurs, not an issue. It's something that's a symptom. And like most symptoms, we don't want to treat the symptom. We need to treat the cause. And we want to make sure that that patient doesn't have a stress fracture. So we're differentiating stress fractures and a heel pad syndrome by seeing what happens when the patient goes up on their toes. In plantar fasciitis, it's going to hurt because of the windless effect. In heel pad syndrome and calcaneal fractures, it's going to feel better. I hope that information was helpful when it comes to plantar fasciitis.